Thank you, ladies. You know, a little bit more, one more stanza, and I think I would have gotten emotional. That was wonderful. And that's, um, Lord knows we, we got too much dried-eyed religion now, so thank God for the cross. Amen. There's only one salvation, full and free, in God's plan, divine atonement was made in the sacrifice of Calvary. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. And I want to say thank you, a big special thank you for praying for uh, Kevin Troutman. You know, he and Melissa, they met here and they just celebrated their second anniversary and he's not coming out of the hospital without uh, a new kidney, uh, without a new liver. Uh, I always get the kidneys and livers mixed up. So anyway, it's pretty serious. So uh, uh, we, we had this years ago, but we, we revived it again. I have a little, um, what do you call these things? A little wristband. It says, pray for Kevin Isaiah 40. 31, and I got a couple extras too. And so uh, if you like one, uh, if you would pray for Kevin, I'll be glad to give it to you, okay? Uh, so please uh, see me after the services and I'll do the, I, I told Beth, his mom, I said, I was thinking about grabbing these uh, prayer bands and just throwing them out there like that. You know, but anyway, thank you so much um, for that prayer for Kevin and for his dear wife, uh, Melissa. Uh, they need your prayers, really do. I've been his pastor all of his life and it's just really a very moving thing. I like to say that there is no man that I respect in the ministry, nor do I love more than Dr. Clarence Sexton. I thank the Lord for the friendship. I told him that I'm almost so dreading this night ending because now I'll lose my bragging rights for another year or so because, <laughs> I mean, three months out, four months out, where are you going to be preaching? Well, I will be preaching for Dr. Clarence Sexton, you know. Uh, it, that's a nice name to drop, isn't it? Yeah. So, because uh, everybody loves Dr. Sexton, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> I do. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. But I'd also like to say thank the Lord for the men uh, and the ladies that have worked with Dr. Uh, Sexton and his wife, Evelyn. Uh, since we're bragging about each other's wives, uh, I always am reminded that Dr. Sexton and I married above our pay grade. We sure did. And so uh, it was good to see Sister Evelyn a while ago. Notice what it says here in 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. In 1 Samuel, chapter 4. It says in verse number 10, And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the men came in hastily and told Eli. And Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the men said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law Phinehas, his wife with his child, near to be delivered, and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband and she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Let's remain standing. We'll have a word of prayer, and then please be seated. Lord God and Heavenly Fathers, we come before your throne of grace. We're thankful for the beautiful music we've heard. 
from the youth choir, from the congregational singing, from the special music. It's been wonderful. I thank you for letting me be here with my great friend of a lifetime, Dr. Clarence Sexton. I thank you for the different preachers that are here from around the country and associate pastors, youth directors, and their wives and their families. We're thankful for the some thousand young people that are attending the conference tonight. Oh, how we pray that you might minister to their hearts especially. We pray that you might give us that Holy Spirit unction, the function for the message. I'm reminded of that old great hymn that says, All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. We would claim what the Bible spoke about in Isaiah 64, 1. Wouldst thou not rend the heavens and come down? Now we know that you're omnipresent, but oh God, would you be manifested in a powerful way? Would you call young men into your ministry? Would you call young ladies to serve you with all their hearts, whether it be in missions or homeschooling mothers? Please, Lord, don't let any young person escape this room tonight without ministering effectually to them. I pray that you'll be encouraging to the preachers that are here tonight. We pray for the young men that have surrendered to preach, that they'll not question the call of God and undo in doubt what they did in faith. Father, we pray that you'll help us tonight. Revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. You know, I enjoyed uh, uh, praying with Titus tonight. I, I, I think about uh, him being nine years of age, and I remember when I was nine years of age that uh, I was uh, in bed at 806 South Johnson Avenue, Lakeland, Florida, and uh, I heard the voice of, I thought it was my mother, and I came in there and I said, Mama, did you call me? Well, I was certain that she did, but she said I did not. And... Uh, I heard it again, Johnny. And I went in there and uh, Johnny, I'm not calling you son. And I went back and I laid down and I heard Johnny again. And, and then I came in and mom said, uh, son, turn on the light here and sit down right here on my bed. I was nine years old, Titus. And she told me the story, <clears throat> reminded me of the story of how that Samuel was called. And she encouraged me even as uh, Samuel was encouraged uh, by Eli to say, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And we often will make much of that message right there. <clears throat> but the Lord did speak to young Samuel, and he gave him the message, and the message was a very hard message, and Eli wanted to know what the message was about. And... In verse 13, we see the message was of chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. You know, I think about how observant the Lord is. How the eyes of the Lord are observing what's going on. I think about what John Brown, the old Puritan preacher, said, my greatest desire is the smile of God. My greatest dread is the frown of God. Jesus said in John 8, 29, I do always those things that please him. And so these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were doing wicked things. They were embezzling the offerings of the sacrifice, taking more than what they were supposed to. And then they were fornicating, committing adultery, in the very steps of the temple, in the very areas of the holy places of God. So now they're getting ready to do battle with the Philistines. And Hophni and Phinehas have decided we need to win. Perhaps they were thinking back to the time that they marched around Jericho, they had the Ark of the Covenant, and they marched around Covenant and they marched around Jericho, rather, and the walls fell. And it's interesting, know something here. It says, um, verse number 3 of chapter 4, And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us. That's where they were keeping the ark of the covenant. That, now listen to what it says, when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. We see repeatedly the Bible tells us the battle is of the Lord's. 
So they were saying, bring the Ark of the Covenant. It will deliver us, not God. Superstitiously looking at the Ark of the Covenant as though the furniture was going to be what saved them. It did not save them. Not by any means. Israel had already suffered the great loss of 40,000 and now they're about to lose 30,000 more, 70,000 in total. And among the slaughter that the Philistines did on this day when they took the Ark of the Covenant battle with them was the death of Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, the priest. So that means that there's not going to be another priest to take his place. Now when the news was brought to Eli that his two sons were dead and that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, he was in shock and he fell backwards off the side of the gate there and he was heavy and his neck broke. This in turn brought Phineas's wife into early labor because now the representative of God, her father-in-law Eli was dead and Phineas, the next one to take his place is dead and his brother is now dead, Hophni as well. And so as far as she was concerned, there was no man that would be God's spokesman or God's representative. She, of course, did not know that God was at this very time raising up Samuel to be the great prophet, who was really a combination of prophet, priest, and judge. She did not realize that. So they tried to comfort her by telling her that she had given birth to a boy. Not because boys are better, but every Hebrew woman, it has been said, as I've read many years ago, that they had the hopes that they would be carrying the future Messiah. But that did not give her comfort because not only was Eli dead, not only was her husband Phineas dead, but Hophni was dead. And if that isn't bad enough, the symbol of the representation of God himself the Ark of the Covenant, now it's not only that Eli is gone and her husband is gone and his brother is gone, but now God is gone in her estimation. So just name my boy Ichabod. Even when we hear that name, we perhaps think about Washington Irving's novel in his story of Ichabod Crane, the mumbling, bumbling schoolmaster that wasn't wrapped too tight living in fear always of the headless horseman. We laugh at that story, Ichabod the Crane. But Ichabod brings no humor to the Hebrew ear because we can see from what it says right here, verse 21, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken because literally Ichabod means goodbye, to glory. Glory is an unusual word. It tells us of the display of God, the manifestation of God, the majesty of God, the beautiful essence of who God is. When the temple was dedicated by Solomon, the Shekinah, the glory was there. When Moses was called by God, there was a glory that was there. And of course, when Jesus walked upon the earth, we saw the manifestation of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Goodbye to glory. That's what Phineas' wife die, died saying. This is my boy. Let his name be a commentary on what has happened here. Goodbye to glory. Let me say, first of all, a nation may say goodbye to glory. The Bible says in Psalm, 14, in Psalm 33 and 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Not whose God was the Lord, but whose God is the Lord. Proverbs 14, 31, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Psalm 917, the nations that forget God are turned into hell. 
I believe that God is honored and pleased when a nation corporately, as a rule, serves the Lord and honors him. You know, it's remarkable if you turn a page or two over here to, let's say, 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says in verse number 7, um, the people were wanting to have a king. And God had told them earlier in the Pentateuch, don't have a king. He'll take your goods, he'll take your kids, he'll take advantage of you. You don't need a king. God was desiring to rule over them. And Samuel's sons, like Eli's sons, were not living for the Lord. And so this was an easy time for the people to say, look, there's nobody like you, Samuel, so let's go ahead and get a king. And it says in verse number 7 of 1 Samuel 8, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in that, in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. For they had said in verse 6, give us a king to judge us. Give us a king. In 1982, Russ Walton wrote a book entitled, One Nation Under God. He made a remarkable statement in the book. He said, America took God up on what even Israel turned God down on. We have chosen not to have a king. 247 years ago when the Declaration of Independence was signed and then four days later on July 8th when it was read all over the land, it was understood that this was going to be a people that were going to believe that we're here and uh, there's no king. We're all created equal with un deniable, unalienable rights such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and they sign their sacred honor and their life to those principles. So in the warp and woof of our nation, we see what was the beginning of the Mayflower Compact when they came to Plymouth and knelt down and dedicated this land unto God. As Governor Bradford said, the desire was to be a city on a hill. And they began the words of the Mayflower Compact, in the name of God, amen. We are here in these parts, in this new world, to establish a nation even in our pledge, it's spoken of under God, upon, upon our coinage, it's inscribed in God we trust. And by the way, there was no mistake in who that God was. When you look upon some of the documents, when you look upon the tombstone of George Washington, who believed he was washed in the atonement blood of Jesus on his tombstone. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Not all of them were believers, but what a nation God has raised up in these parts. I think about one Virginia planter that was a very noble man, a believer in Christ. And in the days back in the colonial days of America, they did not have a lot of the medications to help people that would be in the situation that his wife was in. If his wife were alive today, she would probably be uh, diagnosed as schizophrenic. There were times that this great planter uh, would have special events at his house and he would hear his wife crying out and he would dismiss himself and he would disappear and he would find his wife. And if he had to go back to the crowd to keep her from killing herself, he would put chains around her arms so that she would not kill herself and mutilate herself. She was that far gone. He would quickly dismiss people if there was an event at his house and he would go to his wife and with the chains about her, he would place her in his lap and hold her close to his side and then close in his lap and then he would rock many times half the night or all the night singing to her until she finally went to sleep and then he undid the chains when she was asleep and calm and pray that another episode wouldn't come and catch them off gear. 
this planter also was an incredible lawyer. Matter of fact, in 1770, he represented three Baptist preachers who were guilty of preaching the gospel, and he got them off the hook, and he was fighting strong that there would be no state church in Virginia in the same way the Church of England would not be state church in Virginia, and the state church of the Congregational Church would not be the state church in Connecticut, and Jefferson wrote that to the Baptist group of men in the separation of this wall, not from God, but from denominational hierarchies. Going back to our planter in Virginia, they say that there was probably never a spokesman like this man. What Cicero would be to Rome, what Demosthenes would be to Greece, this man was to America. And finally, the colonial men were gathering together at St. John's Church in Richmond. And they knew that this young lawyer, who was very faithful to his demented wife, and very hardworking in everything he did, fighting for the rights of freeborn Englishmen, standing upon the Magna Carta. They asked him to speak that day. In that crowd, there was a young man that did not know if he was going to be a Tory or a patriot. There was another young man who was full of procrastination. He didn't know if the timing was right. He really shouldn't, didn't know if it was going to be the right thing to do to come out from England or not. And he was there on one side of the St. John's Church and the other young man on the other side of St. John's Church. And so this Virginia planter that I was talking about whose wife was demented that he loved very much, Scholarship says that he may have had her in mind when he would give his speech that day because he did it with a great flair. And what I'm about to do is to go through the exact motions that this plantern went through when he gave his speech. And this is exactly what he said and how he said it. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be sacrificed at the price of chains and slavery? I know not what course others may take. God forbid, forbid it, almighty God. As for me, give me liberty or give me death. And that's exactly the way he did it. The young man, not sure if he's going to be a Tory or a patriot, was convinced after hearing that speech as he stepped out, and I've seen the very place he stood in the lawn in front of St. John's Church and determined, I am a patriot, and that was George Washington. The young man that didn't know for sure if the timing was right and if we really should be separate from England was convinced after hearing that speech that we should and that was another planner by the name of Thomas Jefferson. Liberty or death. Liberty or death. And so the revolution began, which was really more of a revival, not a revolution, for they were standing on the rights of freeborn Englishmen against the divine rights of the king, whether it was Cromwell facing a Charles or whether it was George Washington facing King George. The city on the hill. A government by the people, for the people, but under God. 1976, I decided to do a study on the American Revolution. I thought, that'll be nice. That, that's the 200th anniversary of America. And I'd like to know more about the strategy and the tactics and the genius of our warfare. Let me just share this with you. If I was not a believer, I would tell you that we're the luckiest country under sun, under God's son. But I am a believer, and so I use the word that our forefathers used in our documents from the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution to the Bill of Rights. Providence! Pro video. Video to see beforehand the providence of God protecting us, watching over us. Scholarship says in the fight for our freedom, there was one officer who was the greatest field commander that America had. 
You might think, was that green in New England? Was it Marion in South Carolina? Was it Washington himself? No, it was Benedict Arnold, the greatest field commander that we had. More than Knox, more than any of them. And if you go to Ticonderoga, you'll see the statue of a boot paying tribute to the only part of Benedict Arnold's body because he nearly lost his leg fighting for America in the Battle of Ticonderoga before he turned at West Point. Strange, isn't it? I think about those boys who literally, with their bandaged feet, stain the snows of Valley Forge with their blood. Those who did not turn coat, these were not, as Payne said, the summer soldiers or the sunshine patriots. These were the men who, though their souls were tried, stayed with the stuff. And when you look at the way the greatest fighting army in the world, no hearsay, the greatest navy in the world, no hearsay, fact, did not defeat the Continental Army or the Swamp Fox or the, Green, or, the, or, the, or the Green Mountain Boys. There's only one way to say it. God protected us. There were a number of times that Washington should have been captured himself, but they would stop and have tea for some unknown reason. One of the most remarkable events took place uh, when, um, when Washington was being pursued by General William Howe with a force that nearly doubled Washington's force. And he was being pushed to the eastern seaboard. And out in the sea was, Adm was General Howe's brother, Admiral Howe, the greatest naval commander and the greatest field commander of Britain. They were putting the vice on Washington and the Continental Army. And with his separated army now, with 9,000 men, he comes to the seaboard, he comes to the edge of what was then our known country. And it looked like it was all over. David McCullough said, if this event had turned otherwise, the revolution would have been over. 9,000 in the Continental Army led by Washington and now they're trapped by Admiral Howe on the sea and William Howe on the land. They came to the edge. What do we do now? Washington spotted these humble little rowboats and said, we're going to move all the men to that island out there. Sir, those are just rowboats. He said, we'll do it boatload by boat. Look, 9,000 men, little rowboats. But sir... William Howe will catch us, and when we get out in the water, Admiral Howe will tear us to pieces. David McCullough wrote about this in his book, 1776, but the best, best time he wrote about this was in a book called If, and there was an article that he had written in this book uh, chapter that was entitled, What Fog, F-O-G, Hath Wrought. What fog, I didn't mean to knock that over. I'll get it because it's making me nervous. Okay, here we go. All right. Now you stay there. I'm in a little bit of a revolution here myself. Okay. So, so what happened, what fog hath wrought, what happened when he began to put the first men on these little rowboats, the deepest, thickest fog came. It was so, so thick that Admiral Howe had to stop his mighty Armada-type fleet. He could not come in any closer to the seaboard. William Howe could not see the fog was so thick. It reminded us again how that God delivered Israel. Remember the pillar of fire by day and, and by fire by night and, and cloud by day? And what was illumination to the Israelis was the darkness to the Egyptians. That's why they didn't get them. Boatload by boatload, he was sending the men to the island and then finally, when it was time for the fog to be burned off, it didn't burn off. The sun didn't come out to burn it off. The fog stayed thick until the last man got on the island. Then the fog was lifted, and both of the howls realized they had been had. They had been bested, not by the genius of Washington, but by the fog that God sent. Oh, by the way, the island that he put them on was Manhattan. 
That was the time that the Continental Army was saved. I thank the Lord for people like Peter Marshall and David Emanuel and their triumvirate books. The first one was The Light and the Glory. And remember these boys from Yale decided to do a, a study on the Revolutionary War. And they went to Harvard and they dug in the archives and they found out that something had stopped being printed at about 1842, and it was the true story of the call of the patriots when they went into battle. There was often a war cry that would be on the lips of people who would go into battle, such as, remember the Alamo, or remember Goliad down in Texas, or remember the Maine because it was sunk, remember the Maine. So we've often had a battle cry. David Manuel and Peter Marshall discovered that there was a battle cry on the lips of the young men who were at Breed's Hill, known as Bunker's Hill, Ticonderoga, Concord's Bridge, Lexington's Green, Yorktown's Approach. There would be young men dressed in buff and blue and many if not most in buckskin. And they would raise their weapons above their head. And they made this cry as they went into battle. No king but Jesus. No king but Jesus. Yes, a nation may say goodbye to glory. When you think about how far we've come and where we are right now, my friend, we need to understand that old Abraham Lincoln had it right. 657,000 young men died in four years. And then after that war was over, we begin to see that the full meaning of the declaration was coming into being. But it took 657,000 men's death. And I love the answer that President Lincoln gave when asked, whose side is God on in this war? He said, I'm not so much concerned whose side God is on, but I'm desperately concerned are we on God's side? I'm fearing the Lord tonight because of the condition of our great country. 1982, there were two men that were arrested for being caught committing homosexuality in act. Arrested because it was against the law to commit homosexuality, against the law in the United States. And now not only is it being excused, but now it's being promoted. Did you ever think that you would live today, here today, when the Supreme Court of the United States says that it's okay for a man to marry a man or for a woman to marry a woman? This is against the very law and nature of God who created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? That's the word of God. Would you ever think that we'd be in a day and age where they're encouraging children not to tell their parents if a boy desires to be a girl or if a girl desires to be a boy? This is so ludicrous. People are saying, but what about this? Let me tell you something, people. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't be surprised when kids think sinful thoughts. I remember I was staying in a home of a preacher and his family preaching a revival many years ago. And you know how it is, brother, uh, you know, when we were younger preachers, we'd often have to stay with the preacher during the revival meeting. And it's usually a, a preacher that had a lot of kids in one bathroom. And I, and I remember I was waiting on that bathroom and, uh, we, were, and it was, we had to be at services that morning. And I thought, man, alive, whoever's in there is in there a long time. And I noticed the door was cracked. And I thought, well, Somebody might be in there, but uh, it looks like mm, something's going on there. And so I kind of eased the door open. I said, hello, hello, hello. And there his little four-year-old daughter named Grace had just powdered, had her mother's powder puff in one hand, had her mother's powder in the other hand. She had just powdered the bathtub. She had powdered the commode. She powdered the sink, powdered the set from head to foot. And I looked at her <clears throat> and I said, Grace, have you been in your mother's powder? She looked at me and said, ah, no. <laughs> now I happen to know that her mother and daddy didn't teach her how to lie. Why don't you give those children the opportunity to be children and work through their sinful imaginations? God will straighten them out. 
especially when they come into puberty. Let me tell you something. I remember when uh, I was a young boy in elementary school, the girls had cooties. And then as I got older in junior high and high school, I thought maybe cooties weren't so bad. <laughs> it happens as you grow up, but we live in an insane asylum now run by the inmates and people in the educational world are thinking that it's okay for a child to mutilate their body to the extent that when they do come to their senses, they won't even be able to have children because of the mutilation. This is unbelievable. We are living at the precipice of the wrath of God about to be dumped on us. Unless we have revival, it's not just going to be neat if we'd have revival, nice if we'd have revival, great if we'd have revival. It's necessary that we have revival. Which leads me to the next point. Before a nation ever says goodbye to glory, the church said goodbye to glory first. I was telling Brother uh, Sexton we're looking forward to in September going to Hebrides. That's where they had the great revival. And guess what the leading element was in the Hebrides revival. Youth. The young people, Brother Sexton. The young people would have a prayer meeting and they say that the prayer meeting was so real in the Hebrides that if they were to measure, there was a literal 0.7 on a Richter scale that shook their Isle of Lewis. They were claiming Isaiah 64, 1, wouldst thou not rend the heavens and come down? And God came down. It is estimated that every accountable person on the Isle of Lewis between 1949 and 1952 got born again. And the catalysts were young people. The great Welsh revival, young people. In 53 years of ministry, when I've seen revival break out in churches, it was often the young people. And even the day I go to churches and I hear some of the young people who come back from a youth conference like this or a youth camp got on fire for the Lord and older brothers and sisters and moms and dads caught it. I'm pleading with the young people today to be revived. You could be the catalyst of our country. The hope of America's revival may very well be in this room right here right now on this night. And that is my hope. Well, what should I do, Brother Pope? How about this? Get cleaned up. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Is there a habit in your life? Have you been looking at pornography? Have you been in the chat rooms doing things and saying things you shouldn't be doing? Are you worshiping the idol of your screens? Are you experimenting with tobacco or alcohol? Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. We believe in the Bible teaches total abstinence. It's not fun to experiment with it. And there's a lot of pussyfooting compromisers out there that think that it is okay. It is not okay. We believe in total abstinence. We're Bible believers. Amen. You know, there's not going to be any drunk, drive, drunk driving accidents if there's no drunks. And there's not going to be any drunks if you don't drink. How's that? As the kids would say, that's a real duh moment. We're at the point where it's necessary to have revival. Get cleaned up, young people. Get cleaned up. Need you to get your prayers answered. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Just be right with God. You know what I think it's time, young people? It's time for you to get involved in the Great Commission. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He meant it. Jesus said in John 5, 34, say, John 5, he said, say not ye there yet four months and they come of the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they're white already to harvest. Dr. Rice said the closest thing to the heart of God are the lost souls of men. That's what he had in mind when he was dying on Calvary. Ezekiel 33 and verse number 8, If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked man from his wicked way, that wicked man shall perish, but his blood will I require at thine hand. 
Why are you waiting till you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s to be a soul winner? He that winneth souls is wise. The antithesis is true. If we don't win souls, we're not wise. We sit upon the stool of do nothing and whittle upon the stick of do less, wondering, why doesn't God move? Why don't you move? Waiting on the Lord doesn't mean that we sit there complacency with a mediocre spirit. It means we wait on God to do what God wants to do. But let, let's also develop the heart of God and do what Jesus did when he said the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Are you seeking? Why should we be so in our young people? Because of the brevity of life. And because we are told to be soul winners, not if you feel like it, but be witnesses. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses. You know, I didn't know this till 40 years later. 40 years later, you just never know. You just never know. But someone told me, Brother Pope, when you were in your first year of college, you approached a crowd of boys in a car and you perceived that they were pretty rowdy and they wore and up to no good and they wore and you came at that car with tracks and you begin to witness to them and it was the strangest place because strangest thing because I said was it this place and that place at this time and they said it was I said strange as it may seem <clears throat> I do remember that and do you remember what you said? And I do remember what I said. The young man was driving, that was driving. I gave out a gospel tract to everybody in the car. There were about five teenage boys in the car. And they all started laughing and making fun. And as they were laughing and making fun, I said to the driver, who was kind of the lead proponent of it, I said, young man, I want to tell you something. <laughs> and I was a young man myself. I said, um, you're laughing and carrying on, but you may not make it to the next street. You could be in a wreck and you could be killed. And if you die without Jesus, you're going to go straight to hell. And that won't be very funny at all. And he laughed at me and he burned the rubber as he sped away. Forty years later, I found out when they got to the end of the street, they were in a horrendous wreck. And he was in a coma for three days. When he came out of it, the track was in his hand. And he read the track, got saved. Oh, I need to tell you, Brother Pope, he's pastoring a church, I think, in Missouri now. Amen. You know, I was thinking about that when that was recently told to me. I said, you know, we sometimes forget when we are about the master's business and the church's being the church, which is to be witnesses unto him. You're my witnesses. That's what he said. He, he's about to ascend. He says, you're my witnesses. Now go and preach and give the gospel. But here's what I think that we forget, and that is when we're soul winners, we're partnering with God. Well, Brother Pope, you're up there screaming and hollering. Do you always feel like soul winning? No, I don't. And I, and I hate to admit what I'm about to tell you. Nearly every time I go door to door, I still get the butterflies and I dread it. But I've never regretted going. And you know that's the truth. And I remember I was in prayer time uh, one, 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 night, one morning very early. And have you ever been praying and a certain song comes to you? And this song, Lead Me to Some Soul Today, came to my mind. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. And I remember I was praying and I said, Lord, I have kind of lost my cutting edge for personal evangelism and I'm sorry about it. And I remember the Lord speaking to my heart and said, hey, son, not only should you go out with your church on visitation, but, but take advantage of every opportunity I give you to be a witness. A lot of times we look at soul winning as something we just clock in and we clock out. But we're to always be witnesses, always seeking the lost as Jesus was. Whether it's a woman at the well or whether it's Lazarus or whether it's Zacchaeus up the tree. Oh, listen to me. That's what we all are to be doing. And I remember speaking to the Lord that morning saying, well, Lord, I'm going to start taking better advantage of this. 
And I remember I had a long things to do list and I made a hospital call and I was heading to another hospital. So I took another side street that I normally don't take called Red Oak there in Houston. And I saw a bus stop and there was a young man sitting in that bus stop. And somebody might say, do you believe the Lord speaks to you? Well, if you're listening to him, it's louder than an audible voice when he begins to speak to your heart. And I remember the Lord spoke to my heart, witness of that young man. I said, well, Lord, aren't there other people that can witness to him? And I heard it again, witness to him. Lord, I got a lot of things to do and I'll be preaching tonight. I'll be witnessing a lot of people tonight. Witness to him. And I said, Lord, look, there's not even a place to park. And as soon as I said that, I saw a parking place right behind this bus stop. Don't argue with the Lord. He always wins. So I pulled into the spot and I, I'll have to be honest with you. I wasn't in the mood <laughs> to be a witness. And when we were in Bible college, we were taught, carry your New Testament with you like it's a derringer and approach people with the gospel, be nice and then kind, and at the given moment, pull the derringer out and hit it with the gospel gun. Boom! Well, I didn't feel like doing the derringer. I felt like using the Uzi. So it's the very Bible that I'm holding in my hands right now. And I got out of the car and I walked around to the bus stop and I said, are you a Christian? He turned and looked at me and then I pointed it. <laughs> I said, in other words, right now, if you die now, you go to heaven. And uh, if you're not a Christian, would you be interested in me showing you in the Bible? And that's about the way I said, would you be interested in me showing the Bible how to be a Christian? I remember he had this pronounced accent. He said, you know, I most certainly would be interested. I felt like saying, no, did you hear what I said? I said, well, let me just show you in the Bible. And so I began to show him, and I was really going fast. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And about that time, here comes the bus, the bus that he was going to take. And the bus was lowered, and the door opened. And I said, look, this is a track that my dad wrote. I want you to read it. It basically says the same thing I would have told you. And he puts one hand under my hand. He puts another hand on top of my hand. He says, no, wait. I can get another bus. Tell me more. I felt like it was in a Dickens novel. No, you can't have more, you know. <laughs> no. So with him holding my hand in my track, I looked at the bus driver and waved him goodbye. And I thought, if that young man wants to know the gospel, I'm going to give it to him. I threw my coat off, and now, Brother Sexton, I just started preaching. We were preaching through the religions of the Bible, what the religion of the world believe. And I got on the Buddhist, and I said, they can meditate on their navel fuzz from here to eternity, but they're not going to get rid of nirvana. And I got on Muhammad. He's a pervert, and Jesus Christ alone is Lord, and I was hitting everybody. And then I went back to the gospel and gave him the gospel. And now I'm sweating. I said, and I knelt beside him and said, now, would you right now like to pray and ask the Lord to save you? He said, you know, I would, sir. I said, would you now? Okay. <laughs> I didn't say it like that. So I pray. You ever, you ever preach another sermon in your prayer? So I preached another sermon in the prayer. And I said, right now, right here, why don't you go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to save you? Right here in this bus app. I'll never get his prayer. He prayed and asked the Lord to forgive him, to come into his heart and life, to be his Lord and Savior. When he got through praying the sinner's prayer, he looked at me with his dark eyes glistening. He said, isn't this brilliant? I felt like saying, by George, you've got it. Amen. <laughs> and then he said, you know, I, I'm not from here. I felt like saying, I'm, you didn't sound like Tom Ball Texas to me. <laughs> He said, I've only been here for 10 weeks. I was born and read in London, England, in Islam. All I've ever known is Muslim. And I was sitting here, just for you came, sitting here. And I just looked in the head and I said, Allah, I don't believe in you anymore. And then I said, you're cruel. Don't believe in you. And then I said, if there's a God anywhere in this universe, if there's a God that's real in this universe anywhere, reveal yourself to me right now. And at that very moment, you came around the corner asking me if I was a Christian. What a coincidence. You know, young people, 
one of the greatest thrills. And I remember when I was a teenager, won my first soul to Christ. If it ever bites you, if it ever gets into you, you'll never get over it. You'll be partnering with God. Before the nation says goodbye to glory, the church says goodbye to glory. Why are you waiting for your moms and your dads and your older siblings to be the witnesses? It's time for you to rise up and speak out for Jesus. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So let's be soul winners. Let's be faithful to church. Don't skip church by using the excuse, I got to get my homework. Get your homework done. Turn off your screens and get to church. As Dr. Robertson used to say, three to thrive, three to fry. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, be faithful to church. Before our nation says goodbye to glory, the church says goodbye to glory. But let me close out with this. Before the church says goodbye to glory, the home says goodbye to glory. When we look in Ephesians 5, we see husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. We see wives submit yourselves to your own husbands. says that six times in the scriptures and that should be done. But then it breaks into the sixth chapter and it tells you, young people, obey your mother and your father. Honor your mother and father. God's word said it's the first commandment with promise and it's twofold that thy days may be long and that it may go well with thee. You know, it may sound simple, but this could be the very thing that's keeping some of you young people back from revival. You've become a smart mouth to your mom and dad. You're not respecting them and honoring them the way that you should. You know, I'm glad we got one person agreeing with me tonight. Amen. <laughs> but actually, I think that all of you are on the same page with me. But let me, let me just share with you. You know, I have found that many times my words will fall flat, but God's word promise it will never return to him void. Would you examine with me what it says in Deuteronomy 27 and verse 16? And then we're going to go from there to 30. And I'm almost through, and I want you to stay with me for a moment because this is so important. I'm talking to you young people right now. Honor thy father and thy mother. It is the first commandment with promise that thy days may be long. As a rule, that's what you have. And that it may go well with thee. I will tell you this. If God chooses to bring someone home to heaven early, like Robert Murray McShane or David Brainerd or Jim Elliott, he gives great grace and it goes well with them. Or William Borden, as far as that goes, who gave everything to Jesus Christ. I think about those words that uh, Jim Elliott wrote in his diary just before he died. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Your life will go so much better with you when you honor your mother and your father. I'm so thankful that all four of our parents, my wife and I, honored our parents. We were with three of our parents as they died and the only reason we weren't with one of them because we were out uh, preaching a a youth camp and and that my father-in-law died. But thank God for my uh, kids that were able to go there and be there when we couldn't. My mother died in my arms and I wouldn't take anything for the wonderful privilege to escort my parents to their future home in the glory. Deuteronomy 27 and verse number 16 says, Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say amen. So when he said all the people shall say amen, he means there's no exceptions here. If you curse, if you mock your parents, and there's that old English word, if you set light by them. Oh, I remember hearing the old timers talking about, don't make light of it, boy. Don't mock it. Don't make fun of it. Don't ignore it. Don't discount it. You take it seriously. Don't you mock your parents. If you do, God says, I'll put a curse on you. And the people together said, amen. Notice what it says in Proverbs 30 for a moment. You know, this is one of those places where God uses metaphor to really drive the point home, much in the same way that Jesus talked about if thine eye offend thee. And he talked about members of your body. It'd be better to go to heaven missing members than, than going into hell whole. So he's making the solid point. Take this seriously. 
And one of the most incredible verses here about honoring your parents and the sad thing that happens when we don't, it says in Proverbs 30, 17, the eye that mocketh at his father and disobeyeth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. Whoa. Whoa. What is that saying? You know, the Bible says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Young people, God has a plan for your life. The Bible says in Mark 4, unto you that hear shall more be given. What a statement. Mark 4, right there in 23 and 24, unto you that hear. Just before that, it says, he that hath ears, let him hear. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Psalm 36, 9. With thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. What is that saying? God is saying when we obey what we know to obey, he gives us instruction what to do next. If I were to ask you, would you like to do what God wants you to do? I remember back when I was a young man, when I was a teen, there were dreams that I had. A dream of going to West Point, of having a military career. A dream of going into law. Or a later dream, which was to be a pediatrician. But when my life was right with God, I heard the voice of the Lord say to Caruso Halagon, preach the word. I remember that. I remember the passages of scripture. I remember the longing in my heart that God made it plain. Brother Sexton, I was 100 days from marrying the wrong girl. Engaged to be married. Dresses been picked out. Rings were bought. And I remember on a certain Wednesday night, and it was a good girl, that God spoke to my heart, this is not my will for your life. Then I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me. And the Lord arranged it, and we broke up. And for two years, I mean, I wasn't looking at another girl and this is the truth, and I believe this in my heart. The only girl that I ever really loved was Barbara. Well, what was that back there? There's an old saying, puppy love is real to the puppy, but puppy love ends up in a dog's life. Young people, life's greatest decision must be made before we're old enough and wise enough to make it. Life's greatest decisions must be made before you're old enough and wise enough to make it. I am so glad. I never saw a verse that said, thou shalt go to Houston, but I'm as sure of it as if I did see it. I never saw a verse that said, thou shalt marry Barbara, but I'm as sure of it as though I saw it. What I'm saying is, I'm married with my parents' blessing. I'm in the occupation with my parents' blessing. In the light that God gave me, he gave me more light. When I listened to what he said, he gave me more information. Don't you want to be in the perfect center of God's will? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, accept unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, that acceptable, that what? That perfect will of God. My friend, listen to me, kids. If there's a perfect will of God, there may be a will of God that's not quite perfect. I talked to a young man once that said, I think I married the wrong girl. I said, it's too late now, buddy. It's too late now. Till death do you part, that's the promise, that's the vow. And I think that every one of you young people, when I marry in the will of God, you want to do exactly what God wants you to do. And I remember what George Schwitz said, success, what is success? Success is finding the will of God for your life and doing it. There needs to be a revival in the home. And whether your mom or dad have revival, and I pray that they do. By the way, if your parents are not right with the Lord, they'll get a whole lot closer to having a revival if you get a revival. Why wait for somebody else to have revival? It's time for you to have a revival. What do I do? Honor your father and your mother. And he said, if you don't, what was he saying in Proverbs 30 there? He was saying, you're going to be blinded. Remember, add to your faith virtue, Peter said, and the virtue knowledge. Actually, God said it through Peter. And the knowledge brotherly kindness. If these things be in you abound, you'll be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if you don't add these things, you'll be blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten you were purged from your old sins. 
Harold B. Seidler said, the Bible never said that. I wouldn't have been able to believe it, but it did say that. You'll be blind and cannot see afar off. Here it says, if you mock your father and your mother, you're not going to have vision. You're not going to be able to see who you're supposed to marry. You're not going to see what you're supposed to do in life. Oh, listen to me. Don't, don't discount this. Don't ignore this. Let's get a revival in your home, in your bedroom, in your life. Flee also youthful lust. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Ecclesiastes, when he, that is Solomon, is given his swan song, he comes to the last chapter of the inspired word that he was a right besides Song of Solomon. And what does he say? Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember now, remember now, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I don't want God to look at you and say, Ichabod, goodbye to glory. Or to your home, goodbye to glory. Or to your church. And by the way, remember what he said to Ephesus? You've left your first love. He said, do the first works. He said, if you don't, I'll come and take away the candlestick. By the way, if we lose the candlestick, we're not able to lift up the light. If we don't lift up the light, it's like the church becomes cold and indifferent. It's more like a museum than a church. And if a church says goodbye to glory, the nation says goodbye to glory. Oh, let's say, bring the glory back to our country, to our church, to our home, and specifically young people, to you personally. Let's bow our heads.